Um, and I abide by those regulations. I totally endorse. Nothing is more important than the sanctity of human life, and therefore nothing is more important than providing effective uh, drugs for life-threatening conditions. But they have to be effective and safe. And now to the back door. Admittedly, they're not allowed to promote, officially, they're not allowed to promote uh, uh, cancer treatments. We're getting a class of compound b being allowed into the marketplace with a license with no such evidence of efficacy. I can't understand how you could even draw up laws that make that distinction. I should have thought any law would have to say that if a substance is advertised as efficacious for, for curing some disease, it's got to be subject to the same regulations as any other substance that's, that's been advertised for this purpose. How can, you, how can the law make this differentiation? I don't know. And there was Royal a, patronage, perhaps? No, what? I don't want to involve the <laughs> Prince of Wales in this okay. I, I, at all. And I, I don't think it's anything to do with royal patronage. I think it's, it, the, there's a whiff of postmodern relativism. Oh, in, in yes. This. And how, uh, because yeah. this is a symptom of a much bigger malaise than, than just medicine. But just concentrating on that. Um, I, my body language indicated despair, and that's how I feel. Uh, not just me, hundreds of us who are deeply concerned, uh, and we do have a, a, a sense of despair. Um, I, I simply don't know what's going on. What Are there hidden agendas? Is it conspiracy? Is it cock up? I favour cock up. Yeah. Some of my colleagues favour the conspiracy. Mm. The fact that this regulation appeared on September the first uh, suggests cock up because the Parliament isn't sitting there. It's been brewing up through the summer holiday period. I, I yeah. don't know. When I've challenged um, various alternative practitioners to say, "Why don't you subject your methods to proper testing?" They say, "Oh, we'd love to, but we don't have enough money." The pharmaceutical companies have the great advantage that they've got money to spend on it because they can patent their drugs and we can't mm. patent ours. What do you say to that? Well, uh, two things. Firstly, the uh, industry we're talking about is hugely profitable. Yes. They have lots of money. Yes. Don't you believe it for a moment? They have lots of money. And secondly, to do a clinical trial on something, on a homeopathic preparation is is very easy. It's I think that's what I should have thought. It is yeah. cheap. Mm. And uh, I uh, used to advise the Blackie Foundation at the Royal Homeopathic Hospital on how to design and conduct clinical trials. Um, explaining to them that it's actually quite cheap and quite easy when the products being tested cost nothing, virtually nothing. Um, and you don't need much more these days than uh, a desk one desktop computer. Uh, one coordinator uh, and a, a bunch of physicians who, for nothing, will actively do the trial. And uh, I know for a fact, because I sit on a grant-giving body um, dealing with these things, I chair the National Cancer Research Institute Committee of Psychosocial Oncology, where we, we fund trials of this nature. And you can get a pretty decent trial going for the price of £30,000 a year over three years, less than £100,000. And this is for a multi-million dollar industry. Mm. Of course they can afford it. Mm. So they don't do it because they're frightened of what the results would show? Or what? Well, two reasons. Uh, lack of intellectual integrity, one. And the other, uh, they claim um, that the clinical trial methodology is not appropriate for evaluating alternative medicine because, as you know, we individualize our treatments. Now, that's a very poor argument for two reasons. When you buy a homeopathic remedy over the counter, it's not being individualized. You just go in and, uh, and you say, do you sell anything for a, a bad cold? And yeah, so that's not individualization. So they speak with four tongues. And secondly, modern methodology can cope with individualization of tr treatment. And the kind of trial I would recommend, we could say have a three-arm trial, if you like. We can have a, a placebo. In fact, let's make it a four-arm trial, a 
two by two factorial. Uh, we control uh, in one way by having two awfully nice doctors who spend the same amount of time and uh, two, <coughs> two arms of the child, there, there, there are no doctors involved, it's just handing uh, things over. And then one of the nice doctors individualizes the treatment and the other nice doctor keeps, gives the same treatment. So it's easy to come up with a design to say, is it the nice doctor that's effective? Is it the individualization of treatment that's effective? And the methods exist. Um, that's the beauty of the scientific method. It can accommodate any intervention invented by mankind. We can accommodate it. And with the outcome measures, we can accommodate whatever outcome measures they say. Well, we're looking for uh, spiritual satisfaction, uh, a sense of um, calmness. You want measure calmness? I can measure calmness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we want to measure quality of life. Um, you want to measure quality of life? Feel free, use this index. The EORTC uh, Schedule 4B will measure quality of life. But won't buy into it. I despair. <laughs> good moment to end. Thank you very much indeed, <laughs> Professor Bach. That's great. Thank, thank you very much. That was really good. Um, a very powerful example about everything I uh, believe in and been talking to you about is the introduction of Herceptin for the treatment of breast cancer. And there was tremendous publicity uh, over that. Um, a couple of years ago, at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, big meeting, 25,000 people. We had the first results of four trials which were looking at a targeted treatment, a targeted antibody, where the target was on the cancer cells which uh, express uh, a peculiar um, protein which drives those cancer cells very fast. Now, the, these cancers are quite uncommon, about 20%, but they're pretty lethal. And at that meeting, uh, there was a standing ovation because all the trials showed you could halve the death rate of these women over a period of two or three years, earlier in influence, almost halving the death rate. Appropriately, this went through to NICE, uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, to look at all the evidence before it could be um, given license. In the private sector, those of us who knew the data were happy with the data and started prescribing it. There was a, a lapse of about 18 months, even though the, it was fast-tracked. When, we have to say, women died unnecessarily before uh, the drug was given uh, uh, not only a license, but approval for prescription throughout the NHS. And if you like, that those uh, deaths in that interim were victims on the battlefield and tragic, but inevitable. You compare that, which I think is a totally appropriate way of NICE worked as fast as they damn well could. And in fact, from the meeting in America to the point at which the drug became available, it was something like a record. So they did well to get it uh, approved in, over that short time. But you compare that when actually lives are lost because we're talking about life-threatening disease with drugs which actually save lives to the way that ineffective irrational remedies are just being nodded through. I mean, it makes you weep. <laughs>